good afternoon. My name is Eli Hardy Howes. Can you please tell me your full name? Good afternoon. My name is Neet Dishani. Okay, and what shall I call you? You can just address me by my first name, that is Meet. This is Meet. He's from Gujarat in India and he's preparing for his IELTS test to work as a doctor in the UK. He's a member of EnglishProTips.com and we got together to do a practice speaking test before his real IELTS test. Meet is very articulate and has a great range of vocabulary, which I've highlighted above. Also, stick around until the end of the speaking test because I give him some feedback and you'll hear his great tips for how to improve your English language skills. Okay. Now, me in this first part, I'd like to ask you some questions about yourself. Let's first of all talk about your neighborhood. Is your neighborhood a nice place to live in? Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Being asked about your neighborhood is very common in IELTS part one. Now, Meet has a lot of great vocabulary for describing his neighborhood, like peaceful area, helpful and decent neighbors, and talking about the amenities around him. Have a listen. I would say it is a pretty brilliant place to live because it is peaceful area. Uh, the neighbors are pretty helpful and decent people, and they are always uh, ready to help whenever required. So. It helps during the emergencies. And apart from that, there is no uh, additional noise or nuisance in the area. So that aspect is well. And uh, the, all the amenities, possible amenities are there to make it a better place. Do you know many of your neighbors? Uh, I do, because I believe that neighbors are, as they say, neighbors are your first relatives because they are the first responders whenever any emergency arises. So I try to have a good relationship with them and I think, I think I'm doing good. <laughs> what would improve your neighborhood? This is a very common question in IELTS. What would improve your, so what would improve your neighborhood? What would improve your job, your school? Have a think about how you would answer this common question before you go to do your IELTS test. I think a, a, a very little thing that is lacking is an absence of a swimming pool because all the other amenities are available in my neighborhood area. I can get whatever I want, but the swimming pool is lacking and that is the reason why I have to go to a far place for do, like to do that activity and swimming is pretty fun I believe and that is the reason why if it is given like if, if it is developed in my area it would be a great thing. Let's move on let's talk about learning English. Do you think right. English is an easy language to learn? In my opinion English is definitely easy to learn when we compare it with uh, other languages which are hard to learn, for example, Chinese or Russian, because they are uh, uh, having different pronunciations and features and uh, the writing is also difficult. But with the, that is not the case with English. And uh, pretty much everyone can relate to English because English has uh, got many words from different languages around the world and people can easily relate themselves with English. So that is a good part uh, which makes English easy to learn. And what motivates you to learn English? So I come from a country where English is a second official language. Uh, and apart from that fact, I believe that I see myself working in an English-speaking country where I would, I would be required to communicate with native English speakers and if I would learn further English uh, and I would make myself better in English, then it would really help me with my personal as well as pro uh, professional progress of uh, like my career. Hmm. Um, what advice would you give to someone that wants to learn English? Uh, the first advice I would give is to 
listen to native speakers because as per my belief a native speakers are the one who can help you with uh, all the features of pronunciation and all the uh, different aspects of learning because a person basically learns language by listening to it and uh, it really helps uh, people to learn it by that because uh, as i have observed in the real life that toddlers love, uh, learn language by listening to adults and the same applies for adults as well um do you think it is possible for people to become fluent in a foreign language if they start learning that foreign language late in their life uh, i certainly believe so because uh, i would give my own example for uh, when i was 18 i started to learn russian uh, and uh, by the time i was 22 people from russia the native speakers would tell me that i almost speak fluently without any accent so it was pretty good to learn the, that language that way and i think that is definitely possible if a person tries really hard a good idea in the ielts test is to give examples this allows us to develop our answers if you see my other videos you'll know that i like a method called the ree method which stands for respond elaborate example which is a way that we can give fully developed answers so what we do is we give a brief response to the question then we elaborate and finally give an example as well let's move on let's talk about playing board games are there any board games that are especially popular in your country as i have mentioned i come from india and i believe chess was was invented in india uh like long long back and it is pretty popular game uh, in india to be honest and everyone loves to play that game because uh, that provides people with uh the stimulation to the mind and people need to have a lot of brainstorming while playing that so that is the reason it is extremely popular in india Mm -hmm. uh, did you play any board games when you were younger? I just mentioned the REE method which is respond elaborate example. Have a look at how me answers this question by giving a brief response and then elaborating on his answer and giving an example of the board games he would play. I certainly did. Uh I vividly remember that when I was younger I used to play a lot of board games. uh for example chess and many other games because uh india is a warm country and it gets pretty hot during the summers and it pretty like it, it is almost impossible to go outside and play because otherwise you would get sunburned so i i remember that i used to stay indoors with my old friends other kids and we used to play a lot of board games So me now in this next part I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for 1 to 2 minutes before right. you talk you're going to have 1 minute to think about what you want to say and you can make some notes if you wish do you understand Thank you Okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and that will allow you to see your topic Okay can you see that now meet Okay. Okay, so you have 1 minute to prepare. This is a very typical part 2 topic. Meet has to describe a time he spent a long time traveling from one place to another. Now, a good idea for part 2 is to tell a story. When we tell stories, we use a lot of different grammatical tenses, time phrases, and rich vocabulary. Telling a story also makes it much easier to speak for 2 minutes. Let's have a listen to Meet's story. All right, Meet. Remember you have 1 to 2 minutes for this. So don't worry if I stop you. I'll tell you when the time is up. Can you start speaking now, please? Hi. Right. So I would be describing about a recent trip which we took uh here in England, uh in the UK basically. So uh we were traveling from North Wales to Scotland. and it was a uh, anniversary of my brother marriage anniversary of my brother and my sister in law so uh, the area is pretty far away from my place 
and uh, we traveled almost 6 to 7 hours by car and uh, it was pretty long way to be honest because uh, you cannot spend sitting uh, almost half a day while while traveling but uh, uh, i would say that it was a good experience because the car was comfortable and uh, especially we were enjoying the scenery which was around us because uh, I assume, uh, like, I, I'm sure that uh, Scotland is a beautiful country and there was there were uh, picturesque views which were landscape views which were around us and we uh, even, uh, we were enjoying each other's company. We were singing the songs along and uh, we were listening to the music and we also tried to uh, invent some games to play uh, while we were traveling. So, although it was long, journey but it was pretty fun to be honest and we uh, thoroughly enjoyed that journey uh, after that once we reached to the uh, scotland to the glasgow i, I uh, to be precise uh, we stayed there for a day and we were pretty tired by the time we reached that and uh, but the thing is uh, when you are traveling by car with the company of people whom you like a lot so it it really gives you pleasure and you can remember those journeys throughout the years. You can cherish those memories for years to come. And I believe that it will Thank be the you. same. Thank you. Uh, would right. you like to take this journey again? You'll notice that at the end of Meets Part 2, I asked a question. This is called a follow-up question. And you might be asked one of these follow-up questions in your IELTS test. If you do, it's fine just to give a short answer like yes or no. You don't have to speak at length answering this question. I, I, I hope so. I, I'll, I'll be able to do that again because it was pretty fun. We visited many places. Uh, uh, and one place to be uh, exact, that was Glen Finnan, where the movie Harry Potter was shot. And I just love that place. Wonderful. Okay, now we're going to move on. I'm going to ask you some more general questions related to your topic. Let's right. first of all consider traveling. Um, do you think there's much of a difference between traveling and going on holiday? There is certainly a difference between the two because when you are going on a holiday, you would be you would your mind would be prepared for a fun time while it is not the same with every type of traveling because there are certain travel uh, which are related to business work or for studies or for attending conferences and then and in those times you are uh, focusing on your work rather than uh, the fun of traveling but it is not the same while you are going for a holiday you are all uh, jacked up for the uh, either mountains or seashores and it, it is pretty fun. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to someone that wants to go traveling, so maybe a young person that wants to go traveling for the first time? Oh, it is a tricky question. I think uh, I would say that uh, rather than click pictures of the place it is uh, essential for us to uh, to appreciate the beauty uh, like while we are there so the pictures are usually taken to look at them afterwards but in the meantime we forget the fun like to have while we are on the journey so it is pretty crucial for us to remember ourselves that we are traveling to not have um, tick marks or to have pictures from that place, but to enjoy the beauty of the place. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on. Let's talk about living in a foreign country. Um, what okay. kind of people do you think enjoy the challenge of living in a foreign country? Uh, so I'm myself living in a foreign country and I would try to describe myself a bit. I think I'm a pretty outgoing person. Uh, I'm not an introvert, to be honest, and I love to interact with new people to learn about their culture. So in part three, you want to avoid talking about yourself too much. 
Remember, in part one, you are asked about questions about yourself and your experiences. But in part three, you are asked more general questions about your ideas on more abstract topics. It's fine to talk briefly about yourself, but try to talk about people in general rather than focusing on yourself too much. So the people who are like me, maybe like may love to go uh, to foreign country. Other thing is that many people find uh, nice opportunities abroad. So it gives them uh, good financial as well as uh, uh, according to the life standards good opportunity to work in other countries. So it is pretty fun. And I think nowadays we have become globalized and multicultured. So we are like a, a small village, uh, like around the world. And it is pretty fun to be at other country, to l live and to, uh, to work as well. What can make living in a foreign country difficult? Remember how I said you shouldn't talk about yourself too much in part three? This is a good example of how Meat is talking about people in general rather than himself. He could talk about his own experiences, but instead he discusses the things that people in general find difficult about living abroad. So I think initially a person might find some sort of cultural practices uh, alien to them and he might land into a cultural shock for that matter. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a person uh, stays for a long time, he eventually would adopt to the practices which are being followed in the country and he would uh, acquaint himself with all the uh, nuances of the culture. So it would like go away, like go on with the time, but initially it might affect a bit. Mm. Um, what can make it, for example, difficult to form close relationships with the people living in a foreign country? So, for example, if someone moves to a foreign country, how can they get to know the people from that country? And what can make it difficult for them to form close relationships with those people? Oh, uh... From my experience, I firmly believe that if the person who is moving to a foreign country tries himself, tries himself and he, he does it uh, better like to initiate the conversation because I feel that it is pretty essential for the country uh, the, for the pe the person who is moving to another country to initiate because it is not going to be like in majority of the cases, it is not going to be from the other side. So it might be difficult for someone to who is introvert and who is not able to initiate the conversation with strangers. Uh, uh, yeah, that is the reason why maybe many people fail to uh, have close relationships with people in another country. Do you think it's a good idea to study the culture or the history of the foreign country you're moving to before you move there? In my standpoint, it is a really good idea, to be honest, because if you are having a little bit of knowledge of the culture, the chances decreases uh, tremendously of of being yourself into a situation where you might find it awkward between the people. Uh, and uh, it can become a little bit depressing if a person finds himself in a situation where everyone is staring at him because of certain thing he has done, which according to him is not a bad thing or not a unusual thing. But uh, yeah, it is always good to learn a little bit about the culture when you are traveling. Mm -hmm. And it also helps, in my belief, to broaden your mind. Thank you very much. That is the end of the speaking test. Thank you. So how do you feel, Meet? I think uh, maybe I, I did good, but uh, there were some hesitation regarding to the, some, some of the questions were a bit tricky.
you answer. <laughs> yeah, so you did very, very well, Meet. You did very well. So um, band eight for sure. And oh, yeah, so you. congratulations. Very oh. impressive speaking test. Um, and what we're going to do is go through each part of it together. Um, and I wouldn't, right. say, I wouldn't say hesitation was um, a big issue for you, actually. It, okay. It's natural to have some hesitation. Um, and right. examiners, what they'll do is they distinguish between lang language-related hesitation and content-related hesitation. So language-related hesitation is when you're thinking of a word or you don't really know what to say, whereas content-related hesitation is when you're trying to work out what your ideas are and how to convey those ideas. So if you have right. language-related hesitation, it can lower your score. But if it's um, content-related hesitation, it won't lower your score. And in your case, right. it was all content-related hesitation. You had the words there um, and you had the ability to convey those ideas, but sometimes, uh, very naturally, you had to give yourself a second to think about what your ideas were. So that's totally right. fine. Don't worry about your hesitation. Right. Okay. Okay. And so what we'll do is we'll go through each part all together. Um, so in part one, it was immediately apparent that you, you've got a very high level of vocabulary. And um, I loved all of the kind of the collocations that you use, things like peaceful area, decent people. You were talking about the amenities in your neighborhood, um, the nu nuance of the area, um, how your neighborhoods, your first responders, the absence of a swimming pool, um, very nice. I also really liked a lot of the um, cohesive devices that you use, like in my opinion, and when we compare it to. Um, there, and uh, there was also um, some very nice passive forms in there as well, like I will be required to speak English. So that's a passive modal form, which is considered advanced uh, grammar, and you used it perfectly. And then not only that, you went straight into a whole load of conditional sentences um, talking about learning English. So that was that was very um, powerful right from the beginning. And so immediately the examiner is going to be putting you into that band seven, band eight bracket in their mind. Um, it, also from part one, there will, it, it became apparent that you struggle slightly with the pronunciation of W. So word like words you you slightly change it to a v sound so i would say words and you say words for those of you that are watching this video and struggle with the w and v sound i just want to show you the difference when we make the v sound we put our top teeth on our bottom lip like this v v However, when we make the W sound, we make a fa face as though we're going to kiss someone. So we push our lips forward. Wah, wah. Put your finger here. Now say vv, vv. Now say woo, woo. When you say vv, you can feel a vibration. When you say wah, there is no vibration. So let's see the difference between these words. Vest, west. So, vest, west. Okay. Verse, worse. Verse, worse. Next. Veil, so v, veil and whale. Whale. Now, there's a great video by Ronnie from Engvid about the difference between these two sounds, and I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Let's move on with uh, part one. So I, I really liked, again, phrases like, as per my belief, um, and I certainly believe so. So you were able to give nice short answers, and then you elaborated on your answers, which is, um, which is great to see, because... Um, what you're doing there is you're showing the examiner that you can speak at length and you can convey your ideas well. Um, and again, another one is, as I believe, and then again, lots of nice vocabulary like uh, brainstorming as well, which is very appropriate to talking about uh, board games. Um, a, a few little mistakes sometimes with uh, countable and uncountable nouns. 
Um, so okay. you said like, uh, um, what did you say here? Uh, well, okay, with, with articles, things like the native speakers, whereas when you're referring to native speakers in general, you don't put the definite article, you'd say native speakers. It's okay. a bit like okay. people and the people. So if you, if you refer to specific people, you say the people. If you refer to people in general, then no article. And the same with speakers, so native speakers. Um, you said uh, long back. I can't remember exactly what, the, what your sentence was, but it, it stood out as maybe the wrong collocation when you're talking about the, the past. Maybe it was like about board games. I used to play board games long back. So okay. I think the collocation would be um, a long way back or way back. Way back, right. Okay. So maybe yeah. when you when you watch this video again, you might be able to pick up on that small mistake. But um, what what you'll find is for your level of English, because you're you know that band eight, um, your band eight speaking, the examiner is going to be paying a lot of attention to everything you say because they're trying to work out any any small mistakes that maybe stop you from getting band nine, um, or. Right. You know, but you you know, I, I very much doubt whether you would fall even to band seven. Like it's it's very impressive your level of English. Um, so we have part two. Um, the first sentence you said describing about. With describing, you don't really need the preposition about. So today I'm going to be describing a time I travelled, not describing about a time I travelled. So small mistake there. Um, Pronunciation of hours. Can I hear that word again? Hours. Yeah, hours. Okay, no, that sounds fine. Um, I just wanted to hear that word again, just because I wasn't sure whether we had the correct pronunciation of that word. Um, another thing that I noticed is you uh, repeat the word pretty a lot. Oh, <laughs> okay. So maybe when you when you go back and you watch this video, have I just maybe count how many times you use the word pretty. But it, it became right. quite obvious to me, especially in part two, that you definitely like pretty and then an adjective. Um, yeah. <laughs> so again, this is this is totally fine at band eight. It might not be so good at band nine because you're you're limiting your vocabulary by constantly using pretty. Right. Um, now you also had. Um, a lot of narrative tenses, which is great for when you're telling your story. Hey guys, for those of you who are wondering, the narrative tenses are the past simple, past continuous, past perfect, and past perfect continuous. And we can use these tenses when we tell stories. It's a really good idea to tell a story in part two because it makes it a lot easier to talk for two minutes. And we typically have a lot more to talk about when we're telling a story. We can describe our experiences or talk about the events as they come in order. Or maybe we've got more vocabulary for describing things that we saw or did. Also, remember if you come to the end of your story and you still have some time left, so you haven't spoken for two minutes, a good idea is to talk about the future. So you can say something like, in the future, I'd like to take the same trip again. However, this time I'll give myself more time to stop and explore more towns in England and Scotland. Oh, and I'll make sure to rent a bigger car so we have more space. Okay, so talking about the future gives you a lot more you can talk about in part two. Um, I loved uh, picturesque as, a, as a, um, a very advanced word for describing the scenery, very nice. And the collocation thoroughly enjoyed um, which I really, really liked again. And um, also the little um, cohesive, market, cohesive markers, like, but the thing is, and then going on to elaborate on your story, all of that was really, really nice. Um, you said reached to the Glasgow. So when you say reached, you don't need to have to. So when we reached Glasgow, and again, we don't really put the before city name. So it's not the London or the Glasgow, just when we reached Glasgow. Glasgow, okay. Um, and then part three, um, straight away I liked like all the collocations, li little things like attending conferences, um, when I was asking you about the difference between traveling 
and um, and going on holiday. And what you're going to find is because you are a very high level English speaker, part three is going to be challenging for you. So that's because um, it's likely that the examiner is going to want to test just how good your English is. And so in part three, you're, you're going to get some pretty difficult questions. So, for example, that's why I started with the question about the difference between holidays and travel, which is quite conceptually difficult. But you did very right. Well. Um, you used a, a phrase I wasn't sure about. You said uh, jacked up. Was that something you said? Yes. Uh, I was trying to uh, say pumped up. up. Right. It's like motivated. Yes, motivated, uh, encouraged to do things, but I couldn't, like, uh, at that at that moment, I couldn't find that word. So right. I mentioned so I think, myself. Yeah. I think pumped up would be a better phrase than jacked up. Yes, yes, yeah. pumped up would be, yeah. Yeah, let's use that phrase next time. Um, also, you said clicking pictures um, when you were describing going on holiday. We'd probably say taking photos. Or taking pictures, okay. or clicking. Yeah. All right. Um, another small mistake: uh, the difference between remember and remind. So you said, um, I think you said, remind to enjoy the holiday, but it would, in this case, it would be remember to enjoy the holiday. So you might want to go back and see that part again, right. and then it might be worth you researching the difference between remember and remind when we use it with another verb. Um, now, in part three, it's quite important that you avoid too many personal stories, especially at your level. So, for example, okay. when I was asking about living in, foreign, living in a foreign country and what kind of person enjoys living in a foreign country, um, you mentioned yourself, which is good, but then the idea is um, you want to move quite quickly to talking about people in general. So, and you did do that, but I would say do it a little bit sooner. So your answer could be something like this. Well, I guess I'm a good example of someone that likes to live abo abroad. Like me, many people that, like, uh, that want to live abroad are people who are extroverted, who are, have a good sense of adventure. And so immediately you acknowledge that you're that kind of person, but then you talk about people in general. Right. So that's a good rule for part three is just to try and keep to a minimum, the conversation about yourself. Okay. So, yeah, so you're looking at getting band eight, and um, who knows, if you have a good, you know, experience in the exam, you could be getting band nine for some of the criteria, which would be absolutely astounding. Um, how do you feel about that, Meet? I, I feel pretty good. I think it was a nice experience. Pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, again, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I learned a lot, and I, I like I myself. Whenever I try to speak uh, uh, for the exam, I couldn't catch my mistakes from that, which I got today. So it was pretty good to have an insight or uh, an another perspective from from a teacher to. Uh, to have those mistakes so that I can correct them and I can do better in, in the exam, definitely. Right. And, um, and, and many people are kind of aspiring to get to your level of um, English and your level of ability in the exam. Is there any advice that you would um, give to people trying to improve their English or trying to get ready for the IELTS test? I think... Uh, Having look at the uh, question types, uh, I'm not saying that one needs to remember answers, but having a good idea about what sort of questions are asking are being asked in the exam would be good, and have an idea an idea in mind that what I might answer if this question was asked, because that provides you with the opportunity to have. Uh, variations while you are speaking to the uh, but like as it goes uh, you never know what is being like what is going to be asked in exam mm. but how to have a little idea would be great I believe wonderful 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.